All right, uh, good morning everyone. It is uh, 9 o'clock, Tuesday, May 17, 2022. I want to welcome all of you to the uh, regular Board of County Commissioners meeting. At this point, uh, Commissioner Tony Hodge, would you uh, lead us in the Recording in progress. Dear Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you for the much needed marching. Thank you for the grace of being alive to me. Please help us to live well and take nothing for granted. Please help us to be good stewards with our time, our health, and what you have entrusted to us. Help us to let go of the regret of all those things we cannot change. Help us to do our best and then trust everything else to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen, and once again, welcome to all of you. Uh, Mr. Duran Young, or roll call, please. Commissioner Hess? Here. Commissioner Luis Lopez? I am here. Commissioner Felix Lopez? I'm here. Approval of the agenda. Do we have any changes to the agenda, Mr. Duranca? Commissioner, I'd like to move item from the public comment 5B, the CSU extensions bill. If you can shoot, I hope I got that. Bruce. Pardon? Bruce. Bruce. Bruce, excuse me, to uh, 6A and the presentations, 6A nonprofit and grant recipients to 6B. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we have any comments? Otherwise, uh, do I, may I get a motion to approve the agenda? Move for approval of the agenda with those changes. Second the motion. Commissioner Luis Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Hass? Yes. Commissioner Felix Lopez? Yes. Uh, <laughs> section number two, consideration of minutes, uh, regular meeting minutes of April 19, 2022. Uh, fellow commissioners, we've had an opportunity to read them. Do we have any comments, questions? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to approve those. Make a motion to approve the minutes for April 19, 2022. Second the motion. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Luis Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Felix Lopez? Yes. Section 3, a reading of correspondence. Commissioner, to me, reports uh, Commissioner Luis Lopez. Would you like to go first? Yes. Uh, we had a urban renewal meeting that was postponed until this Thursday, so I don't have an update for Commander Renewal Authority. Um, so we'll be having that. I know on the agenda is um, an award for the actual um, payment of $305,000 to one of the general contractors for the Americana Road down there. So that is coming to fruition as we speak. The hotel and the roadway crossing through there. Um, so uh, everything goes through Urban Renewal on that finance uh, for the American Road, so we'll be, we'll be reviewing that. We do have a couple more applicants for the facade program, so I'm looking forward to hopefully approving some more. Um, as our last meeting, we did approve the SERT Theater, um, if, they, if you have forgot, uh, award for the facade, so that we start to renovate the facade of that facility. Mm -hmm. So Thursday night we'll have that. Tomorrow night I have a health department meeting, and yesterday morning I had the Otero Partners Incorporated meeting um, which we approved two more loans. So I'm very happy that, to see that Ontario Partners is gaining more momentum. We have six more loans, uh, again, ready set to come to review committee, hopefully soon. Uh, and we might be getting those, uh, Christy and, and Felix, soon. Uh, we might have to have an emergency meeting to move those to fruition in, in June. So you might see that come through, um, instead of our regular June 20th meeting, it might be June 6th or 7th. Uh, to get those businesses, those loans needed. We have a positive fund balance, uh, asset balance, I'm sorry, $1,008,000, and cash on hand in the bank is $679,000. We have plenty of money to loan to our partners. It's a, it's a program that's just growing and growing, especially since the pandemic. Um, I invite you to go and, and visit with the new Trinidad Roasting Company in the marketplace downtown, and they also are the owners of the Wing Pit. Both those companies are recipients of our partner loans, which is part of Los Angeles County. So let's help support those businesses as well, be successful. That's all I have, sir. Thank you. Thank you. One of the, 
one of the questions. So what is the interest rate through our OPI? Great question. So OPI can adjust your interest rate at prime, or go below prime, or above prime. But the average interest rate is three to five percent, which is superb for a commercial interest rate. Uh, traditional lenders are about eight to ten percent right now. With the federal hike, we discussed that too. We're not going to be raising any interest rates. We're going to keep it the same because we can go below or above, but the average is three to five percent. Thank you. On the 5th of May, uh, the Ag Wildlife and Rural Affairs Committee for, uh, for CCI met with Kay Greenberg. We have a monthly meeting with her, and uh, she gave us an update on the avian flu, and uh, that's a disease that's tra transferred from wild birds to our to our chickens and turkeys and etc. Um, also, uh, there were some individuals that were on the uh, call that. Uh, Express some uh, concerns with the festival's article about the reintroduction of fit or the re relocation of 1,500 prairie dogs to a, a uh, 320 acre parcel that was adjacent to a 20,000 acre uh, public and uh, private lands, and uh, there was a lot of concern that was uh, brought out because they. They don't believe that they're going to stay located in that in that area, and uh, CPW had uh, said that they would do some fencing and whatever it took to keep them in there. But if you've been involved in prairie dogs, there's nothing that's going to make them stay home. So anyway, it was a pretty contentious meeting there for a little while, but uh, um, she she assured us that uh, that uh, they were watching that and would. Uh, Handle it as problems arise, I guess. But uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you that they talked about was uh, the new soil health program. They're going to be paying premiums for those individuals, those ranches and farms that participate in the soil health initiative and the carbon sequestration piece of that. Um, Kate just got back from Mexico. She had some good news. Uh, she's been uh, lobbying them to uh, export some potatoes from our San Luis Valley and uh, they've got an agreement and that's going to be happening so that was good. Also on the 5th uh, I attended the Los Angeles Warfare County Health Coalition and uh, the narrative that uh, we discussed mostly there was around substance, substance abuse and uh, how do we get the message out to our youth and where are we going to put those messages. Um, there were a lot of different uh, ideas and, and brainstorming, so they're going to move forward with that. On the 6th of May, I attended, the, I'm on the board of the uh, Environmental Impact Assistance Fund Committee for the State of Colorado, and they had their annual meeting and update and uh, did a small presentation for them. On the 7th of May, um, and I attended several fundraisers this uh, Last week, uh, on the 7th of May, the Honey Fire Department uh, had their spaghetti dinner for their annual fundraiser, and from what I understand, it was well, well uh, attended. On the 13th of May, uh, the annual leap uh, appreciation luncheon, uh, they had the drive through to the fairgrounds, and uh, we got a really good pulled pork sandwich and, uh, and a bag of goodies. So, thank you for that. And then on the 14th, uh, I went up here to, uh, I don't know what the corner is, up there by the old radio station, uh, ABC Disability Support. Uh, they had their fundraiser. It was a crawfish boil. And Bomb pizza. Bomb pizza, that's what it's called. Anyway, and it was well attended. So Do you see what, what it takes to get us there? <laughs> <laughs> about the crawfish. To me, that's bait, but <laughs> uh, thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate those reports. Uh, briefly, uh, the majority of the meetings that uh, we uh, rotate and uh, in some places you'll see all three of us, two of us. Uh, by the way, I think the spaghetti dinner should be done more often because it gives all of us an opportunity, you know, just to see what's happening on, on the county. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet with uh, some of the uh, constituents from District 1, uh, Stonewall and 
in that area concerned about the uh, the fire ban. But uh, that's that's to be understood that we have not had enough uh, moisture, and that uh, we need to do what we need to do to keep the county safe. Uh, and, and the phone calls came in last week in the middle of uh, the smoke that we had here. You, it was just incredibly uh, challenging to be outside, and, and people were calling in uh, two phone calls specifically that said, "I think I see fire from my house." People that live on in Stonewall and the ash flying around. So, nonetheless. Uh, to all of you that are in the uh, firefighting, uh, Chief Kalakowski, thank you so much. I think, you know, the uh, Board of Town Commissioners follows the recommendation for the safety of all. Uh, one brief comment, the uh, legislative session is over. It was over last Wednesday. And, uh, and I tell you one thing, it couldn't have come sooner. We had the, very, the last two, three days of the, of the session were uh, brutal. Uh, I can tell you that uh, tons of county commissioners were on the call uh, regarding uh, what was going to happen to a couple of the bills, but nonetheless it's behind us and we're going to be hosting a, a debrief on the legislative session, uh, I believe it's next week, as the Board of County Commissioners, and then in two weeks we're going to be going to the uh, Colorado Council Incorporated uh, summer conference and at this conference you know we're hoping to come back together as uh, both sides and anyone in the middle to how do we do how do we move forward because the uh, the math in this particular session did not up in some of the bills that were approved they came so fast and furious and they they got the approval in fact that I, uh, I don't know the exact number but it was over 300 bills that were sitting on the governor's desk to be signed uh, post uh, the end of the uh, legislative session. So that would be my report. And, uh, and once again, I want to remind all of you, if you want to take a look at all the bills that uh, Colorado County is incorporated to monitor, there on our website, there is a link to uh, the bills that we supported, the bills that we opposed, the bills that uh, we wanted amendments on. You'll find the history and the vote and the percentages so it's great information and if you uh if you want to read some interesting stuff you'll find it there as well and or go to the uh, colorado uh, general assembly and you'll find the same information as well in there so on that let's move on to section number four elected official update i have a uh, message from uh, our county assessor joey amaro no updates do we have, are we on, online, Mr. Donica? Your Zoom is working, the HDMI on the TVs or not. Okay, the Zoom is working. Very good. Do we have any updates from the Clerk and Recorder's Office? Ms. Leo? Any updates from our treasurer, Ms. Leonetti? Do you have any updates from the Sheriff's Office? Sheriff Navarrete. Anyone from our uh, District Attorney's Office? Mr. Solano? Anyone with the Coroner's Office? Mr. Berger? Any updates from uh, the uh, County Surveyor? Mr. Terry? Hearing none in there, we're going to go now to section five. And public comment, we have uh, signed up here, Mr. H.L. Woman, are you on line, sir? Zoom's still working, Commissioner. Okay, uh, I'm these TVs to work. I'm calling uh, Mr. Rachel Roman online. Are you online? Uh, you signed up for public comment? Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, Mr. and Ms. Uh, Gonzalez, would you please come up to the uh, podium? It says most of the line to unmute. Go ahead, Darren, just text it. what? 
Hi, my name is George Gonzalez, and uh, I, the only reason I'm here is I just wanted to find out some information on why the little children that are in uh, preschool cog are wearing and having to wear masks all day long. Okay, and if I could take that one. Please. Usually in the public comment setting, we won't do take answers to uh, questions and answers, but I will in this case because I'm on that board of directors for Council of Governments. Okay. So what needs to be done, the, the first step for you would be to direct that to your department, the director. Have you had a chance to talk to her? No. Right. So, and I don't want to answer on behalf of the department, uh, but here's my opinion. So don't take this to heart or don't take this and, and take it to the bank. That was awesome. According to the CDS guidelines, which is the federal government, uh, to receive Medicaid, Medicare, payments, which Council of Governments does receive for child care, just like hospitals, you go into a hospital now in Mount St. Raphael, if you go to the health department, you go to Salud, they still require you to put a mask on. That's because they're, they're utilizing those federal funds. I don't know if Council of Governments Early Learning Center falls under that same guidance, but I'm going to assume they do. So that might be why. But I would recommend that you call Ms. Hartman and I'm going to give you her number, or actually give her, her number, and I'm going to give you our new director um, phone number to give a call to, and her name is uh, um, Jennifer Oliver. And you can give them a call. In the meantime, I'll reach out to, uh, on, on, on your behalf, to, to the director and to that, so we can have that discussion at our next board meeting to see Okay. Why? So we can bring it to, to the attention of the entire community. Right, thank you. Is, is your concern to unmask them or to keep the masks on? To unmask them, yeah. They're really having a difficult time speaking, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll text it to you later when I remember and it don't matter. 
<laughs> but yeah, but we have some vendors. We're going to have a clinical tournament. Um, we're getting vendors every day. Uh, Amy's been doing an excellent job as our executive director since uh, since her life. She's been doing very good. She's really been soliciting to get members. And again, we're going out to businesses because the biggest question is what kind of change do for our business. So of course, we're, we want to know what they think we should do for the businesses. And our membership is actually up. So since if I may, sure. Sure. since the city recently put. Uh, an allocation or you know, maximum amount of events in four. <coughs> is this one of the four uh, downtown? Uh, Commissioner Lopez, I couldn't answer that for you. I know that they're doing some restrictions. Our, we're going to have uh, ours down over by Los Unidos Park. We're gonna, that's where we're going to have it for this year in that area. And then we'll see what happens for next year. So it's on Elm Street? Yeah, it's going to be down in that area, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of small this year because again, we have a new board. We can have a whole year to kind of plan for this, but uh, we're going to do the best we can to give the community a little bit of something, so they have something to do. So will it be on the park itself, out on the grass and stuff? Uh, we're going to have some people on the grass and, and, and around the different areas, yeah. And as a matter of fact, we have a meeting, I believe, this afternoon with the city to kind of find out. We can ask some questions tomorrow before we go to lunch and Yeah, we can, and Amy will be able to answer what's better for you. But I really appreciate y'all's time. Again, we invite you to our lunch here tomorrow and sign the trails and good things are happening at the change of the menu. Huh? If you ask me a question, I'm going to Thank you, sir. Uh, let me one more time reach out to anyone online uh, that may wish to uh, use this opportunity for public comment. Chair, sure, I've never said there were no updates. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, then, uh, no comments. Let's go to uh, section six presentations. And we're going to have. Uh, Colorado State University Extension, Mr. Bruce Fickensher. Good morning. Good morning, uh, sir. Welcome back. First of all, <laughs> thank you, and I apologize for uh, not meeting with you since about last spring, I think. And Mr. Lopez, I need to congratulate you on your uh, being president of CCI as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, if I was at the meeting, but I didn't get to talk to you. I guess, first of all, I, I need to update you a little bit on what's happening with uh, extension in this, this, re this region. Uh, about a year ago, they changed our regions to, to six regions, and uh, now this year they're, they're moving us back down to five regions. And so I have been named the regional director for the southern region, which includes uh, the southeast area, the seven counties in the southeast area, Los Angeles, uh, Warren, Pueblo, and the six uh, San Luis Valley counties. So, um, one of the things, and I've been trying to meet with all the commissioners in all the counties so far, and one of the things I've been telling them is I, the thing I pride myself on with what I've done is my connection with the commissioner team in such a years, and I, I look forward to continuing that. Um, it's going to be a struggle <laughs> to put it bluntly because I have a lot of counties to cover. But did it come with a pay increase? It did. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot more work you're going to do. And hopefully some condolence cards as well. <laughs> it's, it's a tough job. Uh, but, you know, with, with Kim and Lori here, uh, I, I have some good staff. And so, it's, uh, like I said, I just wanted to update you. Um, the other thing we've, we've pushed to get a current MOU with Los Angeles County. Um, currently, that MOU is stuck in Fort Collins someplace. Uh, we keep we keep asking questions, but we haven't gotten any answers. Yet. As soon as we do, uh, we'll get that updated and get it in the system. Um, it's and, and Commissioner Haas knows as well that I've, I've worked a lot with mental health, and it's come up a couple times today. And, and, uh, so I'm going to continue to work with some of those programs. My programming duties have diminished a lot since I've gone to the administrative side, but there are certain ones that I do plan on keeping up with. So if you have any questions on where we're at, uh, our program in the southeast area and in, in Otero County especially has gained national attention. Uh, I will be going to Grand Forks throughout yeah, Grand Forks, North Dakota, uh, the first of next month for a conference on uh, 
uh, rural mental health and then we're doing a presentation there because our, our program, the Coffee Brick program has, has gained national attention. So uh, we've had some, we've had some good, good things going on in the area. So let me, that, that's a, I like that topic because we're working on the opioid uh, settlement the dollars that are going to be coming in there. Extrapolate on that rural mental health program. <coughs> you know, what, what is, who are the partners, what's happening, what is the conversation, and are there any resources? There are resources. Uh, we, this was started through Southeast Health Group, um, and so it, it is a very wide deal. I know uh, JC Carica uh, works, he's worked in the San Luis Valley, we've done programs. What, what started it, there's, there was a, about four of us. There was myself, an extension, an implement dealer, a livestock auction owner, and a banker. And uh, we, we got together because there was concerns about the number of suicides occurring in, in rural Colorado. Um, so we got together and we started this program in, uh, to make people aware of people like us in the public view. We develop a rapport with our clientele that come in and they, they know that when they come and talk to us, they, it stays there. You know? So we're, we're, a, we're a reliable source. We're, uh, we, we don't spread anything. And so it's just making people aware of, to pay attention when people are talking to you and maybe understand the undercurrents. So we use what we call the common program, and it is, well, it's a, it's a concept. And it was actually developed by a rocket scientist. And so, you know, it's one of those deals when people come in and they talk to you, and, and to make a long story short, it, when they shoot a rocket, they don't shoot it straight at the place they're going to, they shoot it at another star and then use that star of gravity to redirect it and push it on. And so the common program is that where the people like us in, in the public setting uh, who develop that report, when people come in and talk to us, we can give them a place to go and then shoot them in a different direction away from the other end. Um, and so that, that's the basic concept behind what we do. Uh, we also started a, a gun shop program, which is a voluntary, and it, it was developed more or less because of the, uh, what's the, what's the, name? the red, red flag program? Red flag, no. Uh, this is more voluntary to where you can talk to gun shop owners. They agree to receive the firearms if, if people have concerns about a family member that's looking at suicide, they can take their guns in, they're stored, no questions asked, and they can get them back when things are better. We also started the coffee shop program, which is every uh, Monday and Wednesday, we have coffee and donuts at a, at a location that's actually downtown <laughs> Rocky Ford now. And people can come in and talk and, and uh, you know, just realize that there is somebody else on their side, that they, there is some place they can talk to. Because one of the issues we have, especially in Colorado, is the isolation of our producers. So those are the, those are the essential programs. Uh, the common training, is a, it's a two hour training, and we've given it to uh, chiropractors, massage therapists, we've given it to who all we have given it to. We get it to a lot of people and, and uh, you know, so business owners, we, we, we do it for them. And it's a training, to, again, to raise awareness of, of, you know, when somebody comes in, the, the best thing we can do is just listen to them. That's all they want, somebody to talk to. If I may, Chair, please. Thank you so much for carrying on that program and staying with me because, uh, Last night I was on a Zoom somewhere that uh, said that in rural frontier counties, since 2018, the uh, suicide rate has jumped 47%. And that's in our small communities. And uh, due to COVID and you didn't name you know, a plethora of other, other challenges or legislative challenges uh, that, that 
uh, mandates that are coming down to the ranchers and farmers too. Right? It's just it's just expanded the uh, current situation. Thanks. And especially now with the increase of the inputs, you know, with diesel and the lack of fertilizer, and I mean it, it's a struggle. The other thing that I forgot to mention was we also have given the program to FFA chapters to raise awareness of, of youth to pay attention because our, our use of side rate is, is really high as well. And so just to raise awareness of not only the instructors but also the individual youth to pay attention to their friends and, and you know when things happen. And they take that information home to their parents that they do have problems too. So that's that's great. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate for me, Chair, that we've come to this, come out of a pandemic for two years with our youth and our farmers and ranchers, you know, and everybody else that's been through this horrific time of a pandemic to even a, a worse pandemic of higher prices and inflation and fuel prices. So it's, in my opinion, it's gone from bad to worse. It hasn't gotten any better, you know. And, and thank you for, for promoting these programs and stuff. You know, you, you see the news and you see these mass shootings and you see all this stuff. A lot of it stems from mental health. It does. So thank you for your efforts. Well, and you're right. I mean, the last two years of society has changed completely from what it was. And it's, it's not in a good way either. So, anyway, do you gentlemen have any other questions for me? Or? You mentioned that you work in the FFA uh, <coughs> chapters. Uh, what about school districts? What, you know, rural Colorado our school system is different than metro and urban. And by you working with FFA, I think the majority of our children participate in those programs. But what about the ones that don't? Are you working with superintendents, principals? I know they have an awareness already, but God only knows that another opportunity of uh, to get to help our little ones is just so much welcome. Actually, we have offered the, the training to uh, superintendents, uh, hospital workers, uh, especially the administrators, uh, we've offered it to them. Um, regretfully, the results have not been, the attendance has not been as good with them. Um, maybe that maybe we need to change our advertising. I, you know, I, I don't know, there's lots of things, but it has been offered to just some of the school districts that are what is, uh, one last question, and this is, uh, I'm going to work very carefully. What is uh, CSU overall when it comes to a critical perspective, when it comes to critical race theory? Well, let me put it this way. I, I talked to one of the Board of Governors a couple weeks ago, and he, he essentially asked me the same question about the leaning of CSU to a little a little more liberal side than what we're used to out in Little Colorado, and I can I can deny it. Um, and what we were talking about was some of the, the the feelings of rural Colorado that CSU has abandoned the rural part of Colorado to a certain extent, and so. And, and, sir, I do not believe in it myself. I'm, and I've told you before how I feel about about that issue. Um, well, I can put my neck on the line really fast on this <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, I, I can't deny it that they have. And, you know, essentially, they, they essentially are following Regretfully, what the rest of higher education and, to a certain extent, our lower education is, is also doing uh, in the nation. And I think it bothers all of us out here in the rural part because that's not us, or I don't feel it's us. And you know, you attended the, uh, I think, uh, the CCI Winter Conference, and uh, Commissioner Tony has made a comment. If we're going to be, and, and I'm going to try to quote his words, if we're going to mend the uh, rural, the rural urban divide, we need to pay attention to how we live in the rural areas. Not try to uh, make one size fits all. 
and then to work with entities such as this one to provide the information back to these revolutionary institutions that in a way tell us, well, it's this way, but nonetheless, really appreciate your perspective. And uh, I hope the divide comes united because ag is the basket of Colorado, and ag and uh, farming and ranching is where the hope of any nation is, and of course our state depends on that. Yes, it does. But you know, on, on a really good note, though, you are actually being trained for a congressional district. How many counties do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm, I'm leaving here and going to Alamosa. Uh, we have our regional meeting uh, tomorrow on Thursday, and we have two state legislators, and we have a member of the Board of Governors on our agenda for Thursday, so it, it's going to be an interesting meeting. Say hello to the uh, commissioners from Alamosa County. I will do that, sir. I, yes, I met with them here a couple weeks ago. They have their uh, San Luis Valley Commissioner Association, and so I, got, I met the majority of, of the 12, anyway. But I don't think I met them all, but I met the majority of them. Very good. Like always, I you know I, I appreciate your support for for extension here in Los Angeles County. Uh, it, I think it's a great program, um, and we, we do have some good staff. And you know I appreciate your support and, and everything. And if there's anything I can do, uh, I think you have my contact information already. I know Kim and Lori. I can't even run from them. They they know everything. So. Uh, just have me at all me and thank you for your time. No, thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yes, have a good day. Uh, <clears throat> what do you call it? La San Luis County Orange Orange Foundation. We do have a PowerPoint that um, some of the impression maybe you could hook up to. Is that the case or no? <laughs> I finally got the TV screen. <laughs> Here, here. It, it, it has an HDMI for it. Or. No. I think we got it fixed. Yay! Oh, yeah. It's not long, I promise. No, no. And what I mostly just wanted to show you guys some images. Here, here, here. Yeah, this is my biggest first. Second out the slot machine. <coughs> Sorry, I'm short. <laughs> well, first of all, um, we'd like to thank the Board of Commissioners and Los Angeles County for allowing us to have this money to do this programming. Uh, without it, we, there's no way we could have done what we have done and what we'll continue to, to do the rest of the year. So, thank you very much. All right, so um, we have two different organizations that um, we apply for money through, and so we want to kind of present what we've done and plan to do um, <clears throat> through those two organizations. And the first is um, Los Angeles County 4-H Council. And so specifically, we apply for funds um, to address school enrichment, um, as well as our brand new 4-H ambassador program. All right, so to start off with school enrichment, um, Ever since about 2016, um, so long before I was here, Lori has been um, building a embryology um, program in Los Angeles County Schools. And so basically what that is is um, a series of five classroom um, interactions with um, the extension agents where we cover uh, egg development from um, the very beginning um, through incubation uh, to hatching baby chicks in the classroom. So unfortunately this year, due to the highly pathogenic avian influenza, we were told that we would not be able to have eggs incubating in our classrooms this year, which was quite a disappointment for us, but even more so for the um, eight classrooms that we had eggs already incubating in this year. Um, so we had to pull those eggs out um, and so instead of just abandoning the program, we decided to keep going um, and presenting um, egg development curriculum in different ways. 
Um, and so that kind of culminated this year with um, a STEM activity where we made um, chick robots. And uh, so they got to do something really cool and hands-on. It just was, unfortunately wasn't um, being able to, to raise those chicks in the classroom, or to catch those chicks in the classroom, I'm sorry. Um, so the classrooms we covered were K through three um, in various schools around Los Angeles County. Um, we served approximately 160 kids this year, and um, we had a lot of fun with it, and uh, Lori has really built this program into something that these schools, um, especially the teachers, actually really look forward to having um, every year. And so, because this was Lori's brainchild at one time, I'm going to give her a chance to add anything she would like. Um, basically, the program grew so much, I couldn't do it all, so Cam took over two classrooms this last year. And next year, we alternate years, um, Branson and Cam. So next year, we will also be do, doing Branson and Cam. And we're hoping we can bring back the chicks. Because it was hard. It was really hard. And not much fun, so. <laughs> All right, so that's kind of um, our big in-school project we did this year. Um, so, um, Water Festival is tomorrow. Um, we uh, historically have presented, Extension has presented historically at the Water Festival. Um, obviously the last couple of years the Water Festival wasn't able to happen due to the pandemic, so tomorrow will be the first since 2019. Um, and Lori and I will both be presenting tomorrow, so these funds are helping us get our presentation set up um, and going for tomorrow and I invite you guys to come out if, if you have time and, and see what we're doing. Um, to, uh, so. This year is sort of a building year for the Water Festival. Um, we'll have about 800 kids, and then hopefully in the coming years, we'll be built back up to full capacity, <coughs> which is between 12 and 1,300 kids historically from Port of Los Angeles and Colfax counties. Um, and I say all this um, just to um, kind of preface the fact that uh, Tom and Linda Perry have historically run this program as volunteers and done a really marvelous job of creating an incredible water festival. Um, they are looking to step back and have asked Extension to kind of take the reins. And so in the future, probably over the next two or three years, um, I've been kind of shadowing them through the process of putting on the water festival. Um, and so over the next two or three years, I believe Extension will take, fully take the reins on that program, um, which we're really excited about um, and proud that they, they asked us. So. Uh, yeah, if you get a chance. You're a little scared. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit worried, but I think we can pull it off with um, help of other organizations in town, like the Purgatory Watershed Partnership, as well as hopefully some uh, new volunteers. So. Awesome. Okay. Um, the other program you want to focus on is AgFest. Um, this program started, well, it started in Los Angeles County in 2014, um, and then we continued until COVID hit. And AgFest basically um, teaches fifth graders, is targeted to fifth graders to teach them about food science and how, um, or just agricultural production, basically. And um, this, we start, it's like a traveling circus. We start in Lamar, then we go to um, La Honda for a couple days, and then we end here in Trinidad at the uh, Expo Center. And this last year, we had 140 students from Los Angeles County, fifth graders, come to AgFest. I taught the dairy, there's nine stations. I taught the dairy station. Kim taught range management. Range management. Uh, the other sessions were pollinators, um, simple machines and tools, um, microbes. So they, what they do is they spend about 20 minutes at each session and they rotate around. And we started at 10 and we end at 2 um, every day. And it's, it's all hands-on. The kids have a great time. Um, and and they, they learn a lot. And we were excited that we were able to bring it back this year. And we're looking forward to AgFest next year. Yet, Tony, um, mainly because it's, it's kind of 
in the year on what's going to happen with the carbon sequestration and, and how they're going to, how the finances are going to work on that. Uh, until we get a little more definition of what that's going to be, uh, it, it's hard to do any training on it because it's, you know, I remember it's probably been 10, 12 years ago they had a carbon sequestration, you know, there's a big deal about carbon credits and, and paying for that and we had it and, and that fell through and so now it's kind of starting over again. So I, I don't know anything planned right now. Uh, not that there won't be in the future, but once they get some a little more of the logistics down on that, you know, we, we'll do something then. But until that time, it's pretty, pretty dicey. And I think that's a, such a great question because through the uh, legislative session, that mandate is going to put uh, farmers that may not understand the, uh, the negative consequences back to them for not implementing what is now law. So I would imagine that this group is going to have uh, a great opportunity to put a plan together and then the measurement of it. When we were in the middle of that legislative session, that was, that was my question to, to the group is, how do you measure that? And how do you quantify to give the credits in a proper manner without being punitive? Right. So, I was uh, just so you guys know, I was asked to sit on that board. So the state's going to implement a soil health conservation board to oversee everything else. And um, I haven't responded to them yet because, like you said, it's up in the air. And uh, maybe that would be one of those board members' duties is to present some kind of a process to work with in our region, our area, our county, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt their presentation. One thing I did forget to mention, we have also started a soil health, mental health combined type program to where if you have soil health and health with mental health, so that, you know, we, we've been doing a lot of the soil health part of it, and part of the deal there is the same way of how do you, how do you find soil health? You, know, you know, you look at the microbes, you look at the rhizom, rhizominous stuff, you know, how do you find that and how do you test for it? So that's, that's where we're at there. Sorry. Okay. Um, and I, I will add that Sammy Molinar, the, um, New District Conservationist and I do have um, some things in the works and I mean if that's something that we feel that we can partner on I feel certain that we will put together some programming if we're able to and um, extension gives us the go ahead to do that. So. And CGA keeps you guys in the loop when we're doing it? No. We, we keep ourselves in the loop. <laughs> I was going to say. I, I didn't really know much about that so I'm going to have to do some research but no I hadn't received any information about that so. If I get any, I'll send it to you. Thank you. That would be really helpful. Okay, so um, a new program that we have um, kind of created this year is the 4-H Ambassador Program. And so we created this group of 4 um, hers to be sort of the face of 4-H in Los Angeles County. Um, they had to be at least 12 years old to apply. We had the application process back um, in January, February. Um, and they had to be at least 12 years old. They had to um, have been uh, pretty involved in 4-H in the past um, in order to um, get one of the six spots that we offered. And so like I said, through the face of the program, um, we asked them to do things like help us with recruitment. Um, and a big part of that is through our Clover Buds program. And they have been um, very helpful this year in helping Lori and I handle our Clover Buds program, which we'll talk a little bit about in just a second. Um, but it's expanded quite a bit and we needed help, and so they've been there to help us with that. Um, they're also going to be in charge of doing things like radio interviews during 4 H week. Um, historically, we decorated the window of the Air Mutual Museum, and we had some help with that. Unfortunately, they have taken that display out, so we may have to find maybe a new place to um, kind of display our recruitment materials. Uh, but it, uh, anyway, th this group of kids has been really instrumental so far, and, and through the year they will be as well. Um, we will um, take them on a leadership retreat in July. 
uh, where we will um, do things like a, a whitewater rafting trip, um, maybe a leadership um, activity beyond that, um, and just talk to them and, and kind of get them uh, to know each other and, and uh, create some fellowship between them. So that is uh, all we have for Los Angeles County 4-H Council. Okay, with the Los Angeles County 4-H Foundation, our two focus areas were 4-H shooting sports and 4-H project exploration. And um, we started the year this winter with cooking class. All right, so for the past two winters, um, I, along with um, a volunteer, have um, put on uh, 4-H cooking classes. And we explore, um, did, we have different things. So last year it was cooking around the world, so we had cuisines from around the world. And this year it was comfort foods. And so we, um, we prepared comfort foods um, that had kind of a healthy twist. And typically we have about 10 kids um, participating in this program. We, um, it can be any age, so from as long as they're full 4-H age, which starts at eight years old, um, they can participate in this class. We have a lot of fun. Um, the Fishers Peak Community Church is um, gracious enough to let us use their facilities in their kitchens, and so we do it um, at that church. And um, uh, we culminate these um, four or five classes uh, with a, a chance for them to cook for their families. And so we have kind of a, a family night where they cook dinner for um, them all themselves. And um, it's just a really great opportunity for them to explore the foods and nutrition program. Um, and uh, we've had great success with it so far, and we'll, we'll continue that class. So question for comfort food with a healthy twist. Is that like a cinnamon roll with extra nuts and <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you have protein. You have protein. Yeah, you have spinach. Yeah, You guys have probably come to that class with me. <laughs> Well, the, uh, one of the uh, National Association of Counties, about a month ago, they held a uh, health conference in uh, North Carolina. So they sent, uh, I'm on the board of, uh, at the national level, and one of the things they sent us the, the curriculum for the conference, and in there, I met with the uh, organizer of the group, and for years, some years ago, uh, there is a Blue Zones healthy program, and Looking into that, okay. because at the national level, blue zones. Basically, what that is is when you go into the supermarket. Of course, that was before uh, the inflation actually hit. How to purchase healthy twist on the regular budget to eat, and then basically counting uh, label reading and. Uh, but that program, the blue zones. In fact, uh, in my previous employment, I. I deployed that here in Trinidad in partnership with the health department on the uh, cooking matters. And they had so many recommendations and the families ate something I never had a taste so good. It's because of the healthy twist that you put in there, right? Mm -hmm. You put nuts on a single roll and now you're healthy. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, but <coughs> this concept of blue zones actually was introduced just a tad at the national Health Fair Conference, you know, the county commissioners, how to educate our families, how to do so on and so forth. So, and then one question I have, did you get any robotic eggs? Because you have a robotic chicken. <laughs> we did not. Okay, Unfortunately. <laughs> we did not. Um, the next project exploration and, well, as shooting sports. And that has been traditionally one of our biggest projects here in Los Angeles County. We have about 38 members enrolled in the shooting sports program. Um, we have nine practices throughout the spring and summer. And even though the kids are learning to shoot better or improve their skills, they're also learning gun safety, uh, career exploration as far as um, shooting sports. And I have uh, 13 to 15 really dedicated volunteers that run that program and I wouldn't be able to do it without them. And the other thing I always tell kids that are in shooting sports is, I know you play sports in high school, but shooting sports is a lifetime, lifelong sport. You can do it when you're young and you can do it when you're old. So um, we do have a really big, big shooting sports program and thank you for allowing us to train those volunteers and continue with that program. It's 
fun to go watch that so that where they do this is right next to right next my to his place. House. And I make sure to put my horses away. Yeah, that's good. Because that's an archery range. Yeah, that's good. That is good. Um, the other program we, that has really grown is our 4-H clover buds. Um, a couple of years ago, we had like seven or eight, and clover buds are kids that are five to seven years old. And this year, we're up to 22 members that attend meetings regularly. And uh, we've been having them, we had them out at the fairgrounds, and then we moved them to the Expo Center because we keep thinking it's going to be nice, but the darn wind always has came in, in effect. But the kids love the Expo Center, I have to tell you. They love that chute, and they love to play on that chute. So, Cattle may not be using it, but those kids are. Uh, the main thing about the Clover Mentor program is building relationships. We have kids from every school district that come, at, even as far as camp, that have been coming to the Clover Bud meetings. And everything we do, we explore, and they also learn, but they also, everything is really hands-on. And so they have a really good time. And it's only for an hour, an hour and a half, but they have a great time. Each month, we do one a month. And then we'll have a day camp in June. And on the clover butt side of things, my family's been reached out to like two clover butts for my daughter's rabbit production uh, oh, projects. Oh, that's good. So we're going to have two uh, clover butts uh, coming and picking out some rabbits from, our, from my daughter's uh, production. Cool. And, that's and good. they'll be showing this year's kind of And I figured the best way to build a program is start young, so we got to get our young members back. We're going to need breeders in the future. <laughs> when my kids are done doing it, I don't know if they're still raising rabbits. I know. I know. And the other pro, pro, uh, project is the 4-H Quilting Project. And um, we have 16 kids enrolled right now that started back in January. But the thing I want to emphasize is these kids spend over 25 hours each creating their quilts. And it's not just about sewing, it's about making decisions, it's about starting a project and finishing it. It's about being committed and a lot of them make these projects to give to someone special in their life. So it, it is a very, I mean, yes, it's sewing, but yeah, it's way more than sewing. And the important thing to, to, I need to tell you is this program started back in 2018. Um, we've had over 100 kids in the quilting project, and only one has not finished their quilt. When will we be displaying this year's quilts? That, we need to do that again. We can, because the courthouse is open. Uh, I will organize that. We will get that done. We will get it done. And the last one is just our cake decorating class. And again, that's just bringing kids together to learn lifelong skills, um, because many of them will make their own cakes someday and, and decorate them for their families. And these are held, we hold, held, hold them at the Tahoni Community Center because they have sinks and tables and space, so it works really well. Um, and again, with, with the help of your guys' funds, it has able to, enabled us to purchase some equipment that these kids can use again and again, and we're very thankful for that. And I'm, I'm a proud sponsor, supporter of the cake decorating. When my daughters were in that program, we had cake all the time in <laughs> the house, and they were healthy cakes. And they just much frosty. Right. So. Um, again, I, we want to thank you guys because honestly, without this money, we could not have reached many kids, especially through our school enrichment programs, so we're very thankful. I'd like to thank you too and, and Bruce for what you guys do for our 4-H community, for our kids, for our youth, but not only for the kids that you help, you bring families together, you, you bring all of us together. My, our favorite time of the year, we take vacation time with everyone. Yeah, that a lot sense. of people do. <laughs> and that's, our, that's our time when we take some time off to spend with, with other families in the community where we have camaraderie and fellowship. So thank you very much. By the way, before you uh, go, uh, there is a new building that's opening up in Denver, the Terra, what is it? Uh, the Terra Building. The Terra Building. Can you, uh, perhaps you or anyone, <coughs> extrapolate on the meaning of that building? What is the purpose? And uh, I know we got an invitation to go for the grand opening, and uh, it's important for all the uh, co-ops throughout the state 
that, you know, the science that's going to be deployed from there, the learning experiments, is, in a sense, is, is going to be an educational field, correct? Correct. And I, I haven't been there myself either, so I, uh, essentially the Terra building is, is going to do, deal more with the, uh, the soil, so it'll be planned out. I think the plant uh, diagnostic labs are actually going to be in there. Uh, some of that stuff, and there's there's also uh, uh, studies about water and water usage and, and things like that in the in the Terra building. Um, I I guess I apologize because I'm not up on exactly what all they're doing either. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in there. There's like indoor indoor uh, horticulture yeah. going on upstairs and things like that. Some of that's going to take place in the spur edition. The well, is sponsored that. Yeah, and that whole complex is considered the spur complex. You know, so there's there's the Terra building. There's also the one with Animal Health, where they're doing uh, the veterinary work, and then uh, uh, on, on uh, they're working with the horses and stuff on on some of that stuff. Uh, and I can't remember what the other. There's about three or four buildings that are going to be included in that spur complex. Yeah. I think in the future, uh, it's a great opportunity for a field trip yeah, for so. you know, our students uh, so they can understand what, what they're doing. One question that I don't expect, you know, I, of all the students in the years that you have been working with 4 H, how many students really stick to the going into the ag? Uh, those that are born into families, I'm sure they do, but students that have never been in contact with, you know, with this, wow, this is an amazing world. Further down the road, you know, it would be good to have a 2010 class reunion of all the students that went through the program yeah. to see what uh, what feedback they have, where the world went from 2010 to 2022. And I did. And you know, kind of Los Angeles County Fair does do that some because all the people come back, a lot of them come back. Um, as far as going into the ag field, you know, there's a lot that don't go in the ag field, but they recognize that where they are today is because of their ties to the ag. Right. And to get, get put in a perspective too, like, uh, my son did, did our FFA, 4-H, all that kind of stuff, all the way through. And uh, his academic scores were really good, and he was at UCCS. And uh, the uh, company that he went to work for actually recruited him two years into college because of where his grades were. And because he was a real kid, and he knew he had work ethic. So thank you for what you do, because the parents and what you guys <coughs> help them to, to move on and, and uh, cool. they're good applicants for ag too. Yeah. Even though they're not involved in right. agriculture, they're still yeah. applicants for that's ag. Right. And, and, that's, and that's another point is that 4-H gives youth the opportunity to kind of explore all of their interests. Um, you know, a big part of what we do it relates to agriculture and natural resources. And even if kids don't decide to go into that as adults, we hope that they will be educated voters, more educated voters in the future, um, in order to vote for uh, policies that, um, or people who promote policies that um, promote agriculture and um, protection of our natural resources. And so, um, you know, we, we're proud of 4-H because it, uh, it gives them the opportunity to learn about agriculture in a big way, but also other things. You guys might not know this, but during the Pitney County expansion, um, Lori and uh, Dean Goldman took a bunch of FFA and Florida students to the, to the Capitol to testify, and that had a huge impact. So, what they do is uh, it's just phenomenal. Great, great, and congratulations on the Water Festival. It was many years ago that Tom and I sat there in my office at the college. And he had the idea, and the college supported that endeavor, and, and I'm just so honored that it's grown to this capacity. And Pretty keep it going. And, uh, what time does it start tomorrow? So, uh, welcome is at 8.30. And then we'll go 
Most of the classes will be gone by maybe 11.30, um, but there will be some schools that stay to the afternoon. We used to have a saying, go to the water festival, but bring your own water. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hot. Isn't it? Yes, it's going to be hot. So. There's also a chance of rain tomorrow. So yes, there that's is. even better. Hopefully we will. Thank you for that. Uh, let me call on the King Area Volunteer Fire Department and Ambulance Services. Shana, how are you today? Okay, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Thank you for being here. So I guess I want to start by kind of explaining our department. Um, we're a volunteer service out in camp, which is 80 miles from here, which you guys know that. Um, there are no paid workers on the department. We are <coughs> volunteers. When I got on the department in 15, we probably had four to six calls a year, and now we're more like 20 to 30, which doesn't sound like anything compared to, I know what Trinidad and these guys up here do, but for us, that's a lot. Um, we applied for this grant because we are trying to upgrade our equipment to make us more effective since we have less help, basically. I think we've gone probably from 40 volunteers to less than 20 now, just because our community is aging. So in 2019, we were able to get a grant to upgrade our cot from a manual cot to an electric cot. Um, shortly after, my husband and I went on a call and had to lift a 350 pound person. <laughs> and that was tough for me, so that electric cot has been a lifesaver. Um, even our chief at that time had his back hurt trying to help lift on the difference. So um, we don't have anybody with a lot of experience for grant writing. So we're unwinging it when it comes to this. And so I was, I was thankful for this opportunity. We applied for this grant to upgrade our life pack, which is our EKG monitor and our non-invasive blood pressure monitor. We have a life pack 12, and the FDA, FDA is going to call that obsolete basically by the end of this year, so we need to upgrade to a 15. Um, so we applied for that, and then two radios to be put into our two of our fire trucks because our handhelds aren't as powerful as the ones that's, that are stationary. And as remote as we are, we don't always have communication and for the safety of our volunteers. So that's why we wanted to upgrade, or actually have radios in those vehicles, and then um, again the life pack for our um, patient care. So um, and. We're thankful we received a little, I think about 10%, a little under 10% of what we requested, so that we're very thankful for that. Um, I'm trying to think here. We don't, um, we get revenue from our EMS transports, basically the insurance billing, and then we do a fundraiser every other year. We turn out to drain the community as far as um, donations. Do you also build Medicaid and Medicare for transport services? We do. And we um, we got approved for that in, see I got it in 15 and was helping long. I think we got approved for that in 17. And there's still 40 cents on the dollar yeah. reimbursement time. Yeah, we're, we're chosen along with Trinidad for an audit this year, so they are going to look at those billing fees. I know we get, because of our location, we get to bill at a little bit higher rate, but not much. Um, so yeah, in January, everyone will be up for an audit. And and so, in equipment-wise, has there ever been conversation, or have you had the conversation with the Trinidad Ambulance District for possibly receiving their, um, when they upgrade their equipment, receiving uh, donations from them of their older equipment? Actually, they donated an ambulance to us okay. in 2020. Um, we went from a band type ambulance to a box. I think that jinxed us because now we've had all two patients like three times. <laughs> but no, they've been great to us. Um, I will say we didn't have a working relationship with like, Trinidad and and Springfield. I just think the troops changed and we didn't have a, a working knowledge of who everybody was. So I have gotten better acquainted with Trinidad, Pony, um, Springfield, and Lahana. We've done some training and stuff with them. So, so you guys have like work sessions together? Yes, actually I'll be doing training. Um, our medical, we have a new medical director, so I've met with him over here, and I'll be meeting with him again on the 26th. So. And I don't need to throw Mr. Darnkamp under the bus here. I don't know if our radio system, when we become upgraded, or system, I know we don't have better systems, but if we were ever to, would we be available to um, 
possibly assist in that, or we'd have to go to auction, or how would that work with being a, a fellow agency? I defer to counsel. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. I can't give you a Right. So I think that might be something we can look at and have a discussion down the road for when our, our equipment and our radios and our vehicles or trucks and stuff. That would be great. We reached out. Lon actually donated some. Well, we purchased the first eight, and then they donated another eight handhelds. Uh, again, Lana. they're not as powerful on a fire district. Okay. Um, so my husband and I purchased eight, and then they donated another so everybody can have a handheld when they're on a call. Again, they're just not as powerful as the ones that are in the vehicle that have the, the I guess, the boosters that you have to call. So. And, and again, we wish we could give everybody what they requested. The, oh, the, no. Uh, the finance. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. We, we appreciate everything we can get. So. The committee that, that put this together had a very difficult decision, so I think they kind of went equal all the way down. Right. To make everybody an equal share. So thank you for what well, you I think it's just good for, and hopefully when we have our next fundraiser, which should be this summer, but I don't know if they'll get that done. It takes a lot of planning, as you guys know, to get that done. So, but hopefully you'll come back for the next one. Yeah. I got, I got one other little addition to your presentation. Okay. So John sent me an email, and he says, "Thank you, Los Angeles County, for the grant to, to Kim Fire. We decided to purchase a radio for one of our trucks with the grant." We ordered the radio, and within a week of receiving the grant, it was it was told it would take up to six months to get it in. Right. I was planning that it, he was going to be here today and, and attend to, but I've been lagging in the area, so we decided to better stay home right. and in case something flared up. But, yeah, yeah uh, we did use that towards the purchase of one of the two radios that we had requested. So. And, uh, and to brag on, um, back in 2018 or 2019, I believe we had 32 fires in the area and uh, this little bitty you know this little bitty camp fire department did a really good job and they that. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you thank you so thank much thanks for you let me call it a Tony fire district thank goodness for rain right yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't know this much yeah it was quite blind in sure I am Marta Maria. I'm with the Home Fire Department. I've been for 16 years, and I came with all the volunteers on the fire department. And we wanted to thank you for the opportunity of getting a little bit of money to help out. So we're going to use our money towards PPE, which is personal protective equipment. Um, each firefighter, if they're wildland gear, it's anywhere from 1000 to 1200 per person to gear them with boots and hats, everything that they need for that. Um, for a structure, it's anywhere from 3000 to 3500 a person for structure gear. So we figured that would be our best is getting PPE, so we're probably going to go with the wildland part since we have a lot of wildland fires and stuff. And we've been out on a few already this year. And uh, so every little bit helps. I mean, I'm on their board the, of directors and I'm also on the auxiliary board with Paula. So we feed a lot of the firefighters. If it's one of our fires, I feed them. I mean, we, that's another thing. We have fundraisers, we have that spaghetti dinner, and that money goes towards buying food to feed them out there. So I've cooked them spaghetti dinners. I've made beef stews for them. If it's, hot, if it's nice and cool, we'll have sandwiches. We've had pizzas, chicken. I feed them all. So. Well, during COVID, was that a challenge? Yes, it was. Uh, we all wore masks, we wore our gloves. We had to go containers. So we pre would package them in the to-go containers, and the firefighters would stack them on the table. They would just come up and take them and go. So, so the health department, were they sending you requests for what you needed to do? No, not really. We just that's what we chose to do was to make sure that you know meals were in. And th those guys are really like, as long as they get a meal, they don't care what comes in. <laughs> <laughs> they were happy to get it, and they all thank you too. I mean, every one of them out there, because we mutual late with everybody. You know, so we have usually the Trinidad who come to their fires, and uh, we send a lot of our people out. You know, we have trainings all the time, also, um, which gives them an opportunity to move up in the levels of from where they're at. So I moved up to be a CFBI, which is a Certified Fire and Explosion Investigator, <coughs> and I'll be going the first week in June or second week in June to the Wildland Academy, and I'm going to take their uh, Wildland Origin and Cause 
And I want to get certified in Gamecock softball. And at the fire chiefs meeting the other night, so so you know, Nikki, um, if you ever need any, any food or anything like that, reach out to them. They said they would. Okay. They all have reserves and they're more than happy, you know, to come out and help out. Okay. And uh, so they've got their pantries full, and, and if they trade around, and I told them, well, we got Kevin Branson out there, would they be able to do this? And they said, well, absolutely. All they need to do is holler, and we'll make a delivery. So, so you know. Yeah, and just depending on the year, we run anywhere from 80 to 120 medical calls a year just in the Honey District. And then we also, anywhere from 60 to 100 calls in fires, whether it's one tree fire or a lot of different fires, but, and that's mutual aiding too with all the community. Well, it was nice to see how fast we came together for the El Moro I-25 fire, the winter fire yes. a couple weeks ago. Um, we kind of watched it from a, from a distance, my wife and I. And, and we were members. gracious to get a maintainer from the county. <laughs> To get a line around that because we were like everybody came to the one side of the tracks <laughs> and I told them we can't fight from here because when it jumped that tracks I said, that's it you got to get ahead of it yeah. so I took a truck around and I got Ty took him out there and had him even pull the hose for a while <laughs> but we got the head of it knocked down and that's the main thing he's trying to get that from spreading that wind is just when when got that far too speed here are the other fire chiefs. Uh, this truly a team, that group, uh, mutual aid, and if they'll help out even as far out as Branson and Kim just holler. And yes. Come. And uh, to hear them say that with Joe Lobiano the sitting there too, it was, it was good. Oh yeah, they call for trucks, you know. Yeah. We don't deplete our department, but we can send a brush truck or, you know, a smaller tender or something like that if they need it. But I know we don't want to deplete our department of yeah. equipment either. You know, and time and time again, uh, when we have meetings at the statewide level, the rural counties always talk about collaboration and partnership and mutual aid and helping one another. And I don't know if uh, some of the elected officials at a higher level really understand what that means. But right here, the definition is on all of what you're doing. And thank you. And I tell you what, those for years keep making them, we'll be there. You know that set up. And what, what's yours? It's supposed to be this summer, but we had time to have a call meeting with this for June. Last, last time was around July 4th. Yeah, let us know. Okay. Yeah, we appreciate all the support with the spaghetti dinner. It, it helps every little bit. We'll have another one. Um, so we've got enough to have two of them. So we have enough sauce and spaghetti lift. The rim. We went through 20 pounds of spaghetti and six gallons of sauce. Wow. Yeah, that's you know, plus the virgin salads. It was that, nice. It that was healthy nice. spaghetti, right? Yes, <laughs> it was. <laughs> and all the best seasoning on it. And then all the auxiliary baked cakes. So, yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a whole table of just like in Kim. There's always a, a table of goodies. Oh, well, we, yeah, we have to have a dessert with it. But thank you very much. We do appreciate it. And anything else? Any other questions for us? Darren said sorry he had to go. We had that call and he had to split. So I tell him, oh, you've been praying for that call the whole time. Tell him we do have some follow up questions for him. Some questions. I'll try to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The. The last uh, person that we have, somebody cares, Mr. Martinez, is that? Please come up and uh,
My name is Mario Martinez, and I represent uh, Summit Cares Project, EM Food Pantry here in Los Angeles County, Trinidad, Colorado. Uh, before you, what you have before you is a little, a little explanation of uh, who we are right here and what we're doing. Also, you have a copy of the last three uh, statements and some pictures there of some of the stuff that we do and the way we do that. Uh, we did receive a grant from you back in February, which helped us tremendously. And we're looking forward, hopefully, that we can possibly obtain another. We do look in different directions for, for assistance and grants and stuff like that. We also receive donations from various different people within the county and within the city of Colorado Trinidad. Uh, we do have a lot of volunteers. Unfortunately, because of uh, COVID, we've had to let, let, let a lot of our people go. And we, I personally handle most of the hard work as far as the, the food pantry is concerned because number one is our, our location is still quite small. And we don't, I don't want to allow anybody that might be uh, affected and then affect anybody else that comes and has anything to do with us. So I have to do most of the work by myself. I do have my son to help me, and I have my grandson to help me periodically, but he's in school, and that takes priority. And my son works, so uh, I have to depend on other people to help us out. And even even though it's, uh, it's a situation that I have to limit the number of people that I've become in contact with. Uh, I, we've had uh, some suppliers that we can't use anymore because of COVID. We have a couple of suppliers that are consistent with us and uh, they help us out quite a bit. Uh, before you, these statements that you have in front of you will tell you everything that is written on those statements goes directly to the funding of the food pantry and uh, the, the, the Summit Care Project. We do not turn anybody down, anybody. We don't ask for a lot of information. Okay, as there are some places who ask for information, they want to know where they work, how much money they make, they want to know uh, what their social security number is, stuff like that. We do not need to know what their social security number is. We don't need to know where they work or how much they, how much they make as far as that's concerned. I don't know, we don't need to know what their family situation is. Unfortunately, there are some people within the county that need help on a constant basis. Unfortunately, we're not in a position to give constant help. We do give help to those who come to us on a, month, on a monthly basis. There are some people who come to us on a one-time basis because that's all they need. They need something to help them get along between the paycheck or because they just arrived and they're trying to get themselves situated. Uh, a lot of the people that come to us are referred to us by social services. Okay? A lot of people that come to us are referred to us by other people who have come to uh, get assistance from us. Uh, there are other people who come to us because they come and talk to me personally. They caught me on the street somewhere, and uh, somebody else told me to talk to Marty, and he will treat things that we even know about happiness. Uh, we have to be, I have to be very careful as far as our, our food intake is concerned, because we can share that with them again. Uh, parish bulls that they go out as quickly as possible. Right now we're coming up in the part of the season we're starting to get hot and parish bull items do not last very long. Those items that I can't give out on, on, on reasonably, reasonably fast basis, they end up going to the farms. Okay, this way we have food that does not go to waste. All right, I do not deal in any, I will not do any cooking I don't give out cooked food. I don't want to have to deal with because then you have I have to get certificates. I have to go to the health department, stuff like that. I don't have the time for that. And uh, in many cases, some people will not like. They won't like the kind of food you make anyway. Uh, if you notice the pictures that you have in front of you, the way we do this food pantry is we set it up on tables in, in long aisles of tables. And the reason we do that is because there are some people that if I just give them a in Trinidad what I do is I fix them up with a box. Okay? Sometimes it's two bucks, depending on the size of the family. <coughs> and many times they get stuff from me that they will not use. And I think that's a waste. Unfortunately sometimes they take the stuff and they leave it on the shelf forever and ever or they put it in the trash can. 
Sometimes what they do is they put it back in the box and they return it back to me, which is just fine because I can always find somebody who will use it. A lot of people do not like split peas, they don't like lentils, uh, some of you don't even like beans. Okay, but uh, I only, I, I, when we go out to say you have a picture of like, we go to Branson. Branson is 60 miles from where we're at. Okay, because Los Angeles, Los Angeles County being the largest county in the state, it's, it's not only the largest, but one of the things, it's not, it's just not the not largest populated here, but we have so many people in the county that need help. In Branson, we, we afford help to about six communities out there, which is Branson, Chinchera, Kim, Pritchard, Nevada. We have three communities, three people come from three communities in New Mexico that come across the pass. Okay, so when we have it, what we do require that people sign in. The only thing we ask for them is we ask for their name, the number of people, the number of persons that they're, that they're supporting, and a telephone number. So we'll be able to contact them. The reason for that is because I need to know how many people we supply with. And if I don't do that, then what ends up happening is I end up with uh, not enough to go to a specific location. And the reason why we set it up the way we do is we put it in a store fashion. People come to us, they go in, they sign in, and they shop for what they need. I, do, I, I, I tell people, so you come in, you get what you need, and that what you don't need, just leave it. Somebody else will take it. Okay? I take as much out there as much as I can. If I take more than enough, that's good. If I don't take enough, I feel bad because then there's some people who go home and they don't have enough. Okay? I know that there's some people out there who, uh, they have children. There's not many children up in the mountains, that's what I think. But in Branson, there are some people that do have small children. We try to afford them with baby clothes, uh, sanitation items, uh, some medications, across the counter medication. We cannot give anything that's prescribed. We just, there's some people have asked me that and I said, we can't do that. Number one, it's against the law. So, uh, all the food items that we put in that we, we give out are as, as, as fresh as we can possibly get it. Meats, all the meats that I get are frozen. Okay, I, I don't give out any meat that is thawed. Okay, I can't do that. If I do that, then what ends up happening is I get in trouble with the health department. Okay, uh, I have supply. We have a supplier in Pueblo. Matter of fact, we've got the whole three or four suppliers out there. During during the seasons, we have a couple of farms out there that we go to. Uh, there's the Compassion Food Food Bank in Pueblo, and it is big. One day we will be as big as that baby. Uh, I do know that they were here in Trinidad a few years back. Unfortunately, they only came two or three times and then they stopped coming. They do things a lot different than I do. What they do is they set up, they charge people, right now they're charging people $55 for uh, 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 donations and they get about $300 worth of food. Okay? I don't do that. Everything that I give out is free. We do take, we do take donations. We take donations of food, we take donations of money. We take donations, sometimes we take donations of clothes. We're not set up for that, so we really don't want to do that. We do take donations for things such as needy items for babies, young children, and for uh, disabled. If we can help a disabled person, we will do that. We have a couple of wheelchairs, we have a couple of uh, motorized wheelchairs that we have available for them for use. Uh, sometimes we get furniture for people who are just coming into the city and are coming into the county. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who come into the county and have a misconception of what's here and what's available here. And unfortunately, they end up on they end up on the street, and that's not a good thing to see. Uh, we started this particular program back in 2000. We started with uh, giving up gallon bags, these gallon bags, the freezer bags, and we would put a few items there, some toiletries, uh, a couple of snacks, stuff like that, we'd give them to people who are traveling, some old people, so as time progressed, it got too much from my pocketbook, okay? And so then it ended up happening, this is 2019, we got our, our, uh, our 
nonprofit uh, 501c3. We received that, and we have we have expanded ex, ex, exponentially. It's it's gotten very big, up to the point where I cannot, where we cannot grow anymore. Where we have my sons are working out of my garage. We've been looking for a building. Uh, it's very difficult finding a building. Some people have a building, and, but they won't allow it. Okay, I understand that. Uh, funds funds are, are, are limited, and trying to find a building that's adequate for our purposes is quite difficult. And uh, we're looking in various different directions. We've asked people for help, and unfortunately, it hasn't, it hasn't come back to come back to us yet. So, uh, right now, again, uh, we matter of fact, when we got this uh, this donation from you, we didn't expect to get a donation. As a matter of fact, we're, we had some other people tell me, well, they're not going to be able to do that for you because they have so many other directions that they're going in. We understood that. And then when we did get it, we were quite surprised. And it did help tremendously. Uh, we have uh, some other things that are in, uh, are, are in, are, are in the process. We're trying to find more more funding so we can continue. This is not, this is not an easy program to do, okay? Uh, we do tell people that we ask them to have, do you go to Karen Shed? And they say, well, Karen Shed, they don't give enough. And what they do give sometimes they will not use it. So a lot of stuff that they get from Karen Shed, <coughs> they bring it to me. Okay. They go to uh, social services. Social services will not help anybody if they're a dollar over a specific limit that they allow. And we understand that. So what ends up happening is this also refers them to us. And uh, I can say we don't turn anybody down. We have people come to us, they have better vehicles than I do. Okay? And uh, not only that, they even have more. And uh, they, have, they may have more money at one time or another. But in, in between paychecks, sometimes they <coughs> need some help. I say we don't ask for it very much, and we do not turn anybody down. So once again, we're going to be asking for an application, so we may be able to ask you again. If you can help us in some way or another, we'd appreciate that. If you have in your, if you have in your, 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 your what do I want to say here? If you have the ability or you have a building that we might be able to be interested in and might help us in our directions, that would be helpful. We'd appreciate that. I would, I would like to take the time to sit down and talk with you a little bit more about that, see what direction we can go with that. Uh, we do need the help. We need the help. Uh, we, we needed the help a long time ago. Okay, we still need it. So, uh, this is the direction we're going in now. One of the things is that we have been told to do so, but we do not get we do not get a salary. The IRS has told us three or four times that you need to pay yourself. And we haven't done that because, unfortunately, most of the funds that we get go to the program. Okay. Uh, the program, some, some of the funds go to insurance, because you have to have insurance for a program like this. We have to have insurance for our vehicles. We have two vehicles that we use, and the insurance on that, plus the uh, Something Cares Project pays for the, uh, the electricity for the routes. Uh, we have two vehicles that we use for this program. One of them is a, a, a three-quarter ton van, which is a word for us in the program. And then we have a, uh, a bus, I guess you'd call it a bus. It's one of those kind of buses that you, that, that you, you use for uh, handicapped personnel. This is pretty, pretty big. That is the vehicle that I use to take out to Branson because it will hold more, more, uh, more food than the van does. And the van, I use it every week when I'm on the road. I'm on the road two, three times a week various different places to get supplies. Okay. Uh, we're coming into the season now where some of the places are starting back up where we can go to the farms and pick up items. Uh, I go as far as uh, Alamosa, I go as far as Denver, uh, I, I call us, I don't go to Colorado Springs too much because it's quite difficult to get people in there to give us assistance. And the Pueblo, I've got some of the, uh, the uh, Compassion food. I've got Mosul Farms. I've got uh, three or four different farms out that we use, and we also have a very few people here in Los Angeles County that help us out quite a bit. There's some farms out around Honey that the 
for the last ones that helped us out gave us 500 pounds of beans. And you have no idea how fast 500 pounds of beans will be exhausted. Okay. Uh, I have people, and I have to be very careful about this other one because I have people who donate to me uh, wild meat. Okay. I, I, I received uh, I received venison. I received wild hog and some elk. So when I get those, I have to be very careful with that. So I have to ask them, will you take this kind of meat? Because sometimes they, a lot of people don't like it. If I put it out there and then they take it, then they come back and say, Marty, this is, this is not the kind of uh, meat that I like. They would prefer commercial type meat. And that's understandable. So those are the kind of things I have to be very careful about. And then I have to be sure that they're processed properly. Okay? So, uh, <clears throat> So all in all, once again, uh, uh, you'll notice there that a lot of things that we do, funds do not last very long. And the amount of, the, the amount of funds that you allowed us did not go very far. They lasted about a month, maybe a month and a half. We're lucky about that part. And then we integrated that with some other funds that we received. So we're constantly looking for funds. We're constantly looking for a place to go to. And uh, we're... We're, we're, in the, we're always in the process of finding better ways to do what we do, a better way to assist the people, and uh, uh, the other projects that we also work on, because we don't just do food, as far as I go. We, 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 we help young people. <coughs> the Somebody Cares Project does this portion. The Somebody Cares Project, what they do is they help young people in making applications for, 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 for employment. A lot of people do not know how to make an application, even if they, even if they use a computer, because someday uh, they're not going to be able to know how to write, so they have to use a computer. They don't know how to use mathematics without using a computer, and these are the kind of things that we try to help them out with. Some people have, a, and I have a difficulty also, some people have a difficulty with the mathematics that they taught in school today. My grandchildren come to me and oh, well, will you help me with this? And I have no idea what I'm looking at right? because it's, it's changed so much as opposed to when I, when I was in school. And because I was just a poor student at that date and time, you know, uh, I, I had to re-relearn, re 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 educate myself in certain, certain things. So uh, I, I have other people that help us do various types of things. My, my lady, she helps people with uh, uh, home economics. Teach them how to do those kinds of things. Some people do not, it's amazing, some people do not know how to burn water. <laughs> so uh, uh, we, we're, we're going different directions. We have to limit the directions that we go into because the food pantry takes the majority of our time. And uh, I move, on, the, on an average basis, on an average week, I move 2,000 pounds of food every week. And I was doing that by myself, but unfortunately, since I got this knee surgery, uh, it's taken me three hours to do one hour's worth of work. Okay, and it's just amazing how much uh, how much pressure you put on your legs when you don't do anything. And uh, what else I want to tell you about this? Uh, I told you how we how we got started, and we will continue. Well, we will continue as long as I'm healthy enough to do this. If I may, Chairman, question, sir. Fortunately, this program of the grant process is going to be available hopefully indefinitely. It was passed by the voters uh, of Los Angeles County for the 1A access a couple of years ago. So this program uh, allocates $120,000 annually to nonprofits in the community. And how the uh, panelists uh, awarded that was kind of equally down the board. And you can see today uh, on the five that are here today doing presentations, Every single group received the $3,670, every single one of you right down the board. So it was all equal. Uh, so that's going to be there you know, forever as long as our tax sales uh, to maintain it, that, that uh, percentage right now where we're at. So fortunately, this is going to be a good program for you. Question I have for you, have you reached, well, that's out, to, Thank you. <laughs> have you reached out to Council of the Governments, Veronica sure. Mays? Have you reached out to the Council of the Governments, Veronica Mays? Directly. We have, uh, we have, but uh, I don't know. Uh, my, my wife does all this. Well, she does all this work right here. Okay, uh, I don't because I'm so computer computer illiterate. It 
keeps me from doing the kind of work that she's doing because I have to ask her to do various different kinds of work for me. So she's contacted various different people. I don't know. I don't know where she's at with the council of governments. I, we, we, uh, when we have our next board meeting, which is uh, going to be, I think it's going to be next Thursday, and uh, we have a couple of people that come down here from Denver to start for our board. So we have to sit down and see what direction we're going in with the Council of Governments. Also, uh, where we're at with a couple of buildings that we're looking at and how we're, how we're working to get the funds necessary to uh, acquire these buildings. Because right now, we're looking at a building in Branson, which will help us tremendously if we're able to get it. What that will do is alleviate a lot of work that I have to do here by putting some over there and have people over there who run the place. So, so you, the, the reason I ask is I'm a, yes, board, I'm a board member of the Council of Governments. The Care and Share program goes through Council of Governments. <coughs> I probably overstepping my bounds with the director, Veronica Mays, but I, I will bring up this conversation to her regarding any excesses that they bring in for that care and share program possibly be awarded to your program as well. Because if instead of it sitting there, it should be, uh, like you said earlier, if they're going to waste, you could possibly get it out. So what I'll do uh, tomorrow sometime, and I'll reach out to that director um, of that program and have her contact you. What is a good contact number for you? Mr. Well, you can, call, uh, you can call our office at 72, or it's 846 2075, that's the office number. And you can call me at my cell, which is on me out all the time. I'm at 720-891-1849. And uh, you can contact, well, we're on Facebook. And Facebook is uh, the uh, Somebody Cares Project. You'll find us on there, or you'll find it on Elaine Martinez, you'll find her on there. And uh, our email, I don't know what her email is, but my email is uh, it's, uh, lowercase letters Martinez underscore Lewis at Yahoo.com. And you can contact me at those numbers. Uh, let's see. So, the Council of Governments. Yeah, I'll reach out to, to the program director and have her contact you, and maybe we can have another uh, source for you for additional food where you wouldn't have to travel outside the community and cut down your expenses. Well, I appreciate that very much. It would help quite a bit. I put one on Teller to this year for this news. She'd be quite happy. Uh, sure, you have a question? I do not. I just want to say thank you for all you're doing. Uh, and again, I go back to the same statement uh, small communities taking care of their own. Mr. Huss? In your uh, line, you have the line set up and they're coming in and they're getting their whatever they're getting. There's not a limit on the quantity of each product that they can get. That's that's usually why we box them at care and share days, is so that everybody gets an equal amount of everything. Yes, that's true. Uh, yes, sir, we, we, we do have a limit on, on specific items. Okay. One of the items, because many times we don't get enough protein. Protein is meat. We don't get enough to be able to take care of everybody and allow them to have, uh, let's say if I got chicken and uh, I get, I get a, a some, when I get chickens, sometimes I'll get them in a case. Sometimes these cases will have 25 or 30 chickens per case, okay? and I have to make sure that I, I, they thaw enough for me to break them down to make them individual packets, okay? Or I get what I get pork, or something like that. So some of these they have to be divided up, and I sometimes I have to tell people one chicken per individual, and then depending on the size of the family will determine whether or not they get more. And then allow them to have another item in there. Everything else, I tell them, you can take what you need, but do not be greedy, okay? And for those items that you don't need, just go and get somebody else will have it, all right? I have people who ask, can, can, can we get specific items? I said, well, we'll do whatever we can to get that, that we do. Whatever is left over after everybody has gone through the process, I tell people, whenever everybody has gone through, those of you who are left behind, then what you do, if you want, you come back and get more. Okay, this way, this way, I know that people are getting what they need to subsist. I, I, I try to tell people, be sure that you're going to get enough that's going to last you at least three weeks. 
we will only be here for one one day per month. We're in Branson on the last Wednesday of the month. We go to Rancho La Verita. We go there on the second Thursday of the month. Okay. Then we have various different locations where we stop in Weston. We stop in Segundo. We go to tomorrow. I go as far up as Thatcher. I stop on the side of the road for people to come pick up an item. Okay. Uh, we go to uh, uh, to Aguilar. I don't have special dates for them because sometimes if I have a special date for them, I will only get one person that shows up and I waste my time. So I tell them, this is what's going to happen. You tell, you call me, you tell me you're going to be there, and I make sure I tell them, if, you're, if there's going to be five people, I want to see five people. I don't want to go up there and waste my time. People in Trinidad, I do not allow anybody into my garage where we or where I store. I tell them, you call, you make an appointment, you tell me what, you give me the information that I need to have, I will fix you a box that will take care of you for a specific period of time. Otherwise, they come in my driveway, that's as far as they go and I take it up to them. Okay. Uh, as long as we have this particular health problem within the country and stuff like that, we're going to operate in this particular fashion. It's absolutely imperative that they come they come to see me and if they haven't been vaccinated and like that, they come to see me wearing a mask. Okay? And we do the same thing. Um, we do delivery on a basis that somebody could not get to you not have a vehicle, they're too old to drive, or to give you some other reason why they can't why they why they can't come by and pick us up. We do deliver <coughs> I have people who will volunteer to pick up items and deliver for them. So uh, if there's any other information that you gentlemen need, I'll be happy to afford you with that. Uh, our, our, our pantry in Trinidad is open on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock. We have people call us at 8 o'clock at night on Sunday asking for a box. They asked us for a box on a holiday. We do not do that on a holiday. So my lady says, that's, we have to have a little bit of time for ourselves. It's very difficult. She can't drive, so uh, and she can't get out of work, so that's her job. That's her, 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 she, she does, she takes the orders. She does all the work as far as finding uh, uh, funds for us. I do all the heavy work. Okay, so uh, if there's anything else that I can afford you, gentlemen, I appreciate it. You give me a call. I'll be happy to sit down with you at your leisure. And uh, who has my area out in Branson? You do. Come out and visit us one time, Mr. Hess. Okay, you yeah, yeah, see what we do. As a matter of fact, uh, you may want to ask uh, Carlos Lopez. He came out there one time when he was campaigning, and he wanted to see what we were doing. He didn't come out there for a specific, specific purpose of campaign. He came out to see what we do and how we do that. And he thought, he told us, I was quite impressed. We have other people who come out there. I have uh, uh, some ladies that do work at that, that. They give me volunteers that are elderly people. Most of the elderly people cannot do this heavy work, but I appreciate the thought, stuff like that. And they, come, they, they do come out. We have a lady who does a spreadsheet for us. And we, have to, we do a spreadsheet so we know exactly how many people we afford to and how much I need to get. So it's absolutely imperative that we have all these various different tools in our in our process. So uh, if you find it necessary, you find the opportunity, you want to come down and visit with me, I appreciate your, your presence. Come down, we'll sit down and talk a little bit more, and this way we can possibly give you a little bit more appreciation of what we do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much for your time. Well, uh, I think we'll listen to if uh, all of you agree with me for a second. Let's go to uh, section number seven and finish business. We don't have any. Uh, may I get a motion to take our recess five, ten minutes, and then we'll come back and resume. I will be solo. Second motion. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Luis Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Keynes Lopez? Yes, sir. We'll be back in about ten minutes.
Janice, are you all ready? All right, Gap. Yes, sir, let me get the... Uh... Recording in progress. Is that, is that, it's on. Okay. All right, uh, do I have a motion to uh, resume the award of county commissioners meeting? So, moved. Second motion. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Luis Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Yes. Let's go into section eight, uh, new business, consideration of IFB 22-C006 Corners Cardboard, Mr. Dorian Camp. Commissioner, before you for your consideration is IFB 22-C006 Corners Cardboard. We uh, developed bid docs, solicited bids for building a cardboard out um, at the coroner's office but against the current corners building. But the following results, TCS construction, 48,500. EGD construction, $35,027. I'd ask the board to approve the <coughs> EGD's construction bid of $35,027. Questions, comments from the board? Yeah, now this is for um, Moving, <coughs> um, what's the correct term? Deceased. Deceased from the van during the inclement weather. He was been doing it in the mud, and it's a hazard to him and to the people that are helping him. So he was He's trying going. to get a, a drier surface so that he could <coughs> those individuals. Yeah. And the funding for this is coming out of. What budget? Is this be the jail improvement fund? No, Commissioner, this is actually part of the money excess that we've been carrying over year after year. And finance director Christy Colby, I believe, put it under the corners. Christy, if you're on, if I'm not correct, um, would you state what line item? The corners, $50,000 of budget for this is. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so yeah, we did budget for this. We pulled it over from last year since it wasn't spent last year. So I think this is money from public safety that we had budgeted. I thought. Let me see. No, I'm sorry. What line item is it? No, it's just coming from the sales tax, the sales tax funds that we had in the balance. But we did budget for it. Yes. I have a uh, no other questions. One very very small question. The two contractors are submitted. One is bidding on uh, 14 uh, yards of concrete, the other one on 8 yards of concrete. Uh, is there that big of a difference? Uh, and I know you're requesting a 6 inch bore in there. That includes, I would imagine, the, the metal three bar that goes within. <coughs> just between the two, one has 8 yards and the other one has 14. Just perhaps. Why the huge Why the huge discrepancy? Um, when I spoke with EGD, they were talking about perhaps removing some of the existing asphalt, excuse me, concrete, and reporting some of that there, which I think would account for part of that. And then also, he told me that the pylons that need to be poured for the posts, the size of the pylon that was in the mid dock is actually incorrect. They said an eight inch diameter pylon, they need to be 12. I'm not pointing fingers, but I got that information from our, our building inspector because I know nothing about those codes. So I, that's going to take a little bit more of the concrete. So that's where the only thing I can assume the difference in the concrete. And, so and they're both afforded that. They were both afforded that information and made yeah. the bid. And there was probably a walk through for the bid, correct? I, mean, I think they caught up with the current corner. I believe mean, they did. But no, I did not. Require a walkthrough. That was, in my opinion, a big enough project to do that. But we also allow within the bid documents, and I think it's underneath the notes. Um, item three, which is uh, page six of the bid docs. Item three, county of city value engineering change proposals mm -hmm. by the successful bidder. So they have an opportunity, the bidders do, to. They see something that's incorrect to go ahead and correct the rules of the docs, and then get back to it. And I also sent the bid documents out to both of our building inspectors, the coroner, uh, 
um, all the staff asking for input before I sent this out to the public um, as to whether or not there's any changes that need to be made. And only one response, and that was to put a rain gutter on the west side and down the other side of the roof. So. Any other questions? Uh, I would entertain the motion. I would move for approval of the IFB 22-CD006 to, I'm trying to find it here, EGD construction for $35,027. Second the motion. Commissioner Lee Smithers? Yes. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Pete Smithers? Yes. 8B, consideration of Colorado Commission of Reclamation, Mining and Safety, and 198-3039, Airport Peak Annual Report, Map and Fee. Mr. Dorian. Commissioners, we, the board's considered these types of uh, applications or renewals uh, or permits a number of times. The same here, it's the Airport Gravel Pit, the permitted acreage is 175 acres, and the fee is $791. I'd ask the board to approve the fee and also the report and map that's part of the uh, renewal. Okay. Discussion from the board. Otherwise, I will entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve the M198-309 Airport Pit and Report Map and Fee. Second the motion. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Luis Yes. Commissioner Pete Yes. yes. Item 8C, consideration of OBCC number 6994 to Florence Amore in the amount of $8.20. I think we have the information in there, pretty much a standard uh, refund. Any questions? Otherwise, I will entertain a motion. Move for approval of OBCC number 6994 to Florence Amore in the amount of $8.20. Second. Commissioner Luis Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Felix Lopez? Yes. Item 8D, consideration of OBCC number 6995 to Adan Cadena in the amount of $8.20. Same process, any questions? Otherwise, I will entertain a motion. A motion to approve OBCC number 6995 in the amount of $8.20. Second the motion. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Luis Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Felix Lopez? Yes. 8E, consideration of OBCC number 6996 to Ogres operating in the amount of $16.40. Question, comments? Otherwise, I will entertain a motion. For, for approval of OBCC number 6996 to Ogres operating $16.40. Second. Commissioner Luis Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Hass? Yes. Commissioner Felix Lopez? Yes. 8F, consideration of IFB 22-R007 curb greater rates through Harden. Mr. Permacamp. Commissioner, before you for your consideration is IFB 22-R007 curb greater rates through Harden. We wrote a vision department solicited uh, bids for the delivery of a truckload uh, through Harden. Uh, cutting edges, for lack of a better way to describe it, with the following results. Water parts, $50,638. Four rivers, $44,332.80. Fire equipment, $46,248. Ask the board to approve Four members bid at $44,332.86. Any questions from the board? We have this budgeted, uh, Mr. Duncan, in the board of Yes, sir. But uh, I budgeted $35,000. It's close to $45,000. I should say, yes, because we have We have the funding to cover it. We have the funding to cover it. Yes, we do. We have the funds in uh, our chip sale chip oil that I'm going to be using to cover unexpected increases in materials. When, when it came to the, uh, the price per blade, 
are they all pretty much the same specification and standard and all the prices that we have they all have one one different price and but as far as the spec of the thickness and what you expect do they meet all the specs? Yes they do. Uh, all of them are supposed to be three quarter inch thick cutting edges with five eighths inch punch holes like a typical C dot punch hole. Any other questions? Otherwise, I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve IFB 22R007 Kurt Greater Blades through Harden to Four Rivers Equipment in the amount of $44,332.80. Second the motion. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Luis Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Pete Lopez? Yes. AG <coughs> consideration of 22-C004 change order number one square yardage of sidewalk and linear feet of curb and gutter on Linden Avenue, County Road 71.1. Mr. Dorian County. Commissioner, before you, for your consideration, I have to be number 22C004. As Commissioner Lopez said, you spoke an increase in the square yardage of sidewalk and linear footage of curb and gutter on County Road 71 This is part of the Seattle Main Street grant. There were two sections of the curb that were not scoped in the original bid documents that the contractor brought to our attention said he didn't like the idea of replacing all those that had been busted and all this new sidewalk and everything else and then leaving two sections just um, on the exit and the entrance parts into the fairgrounds busted so i thought well that makes sense we have the funds in the little bridge department we'll fix them while you're there and then on the sidewalk our operators inadvertently ran over a piece of the sidewalk. I think it was 11 lineal footage, uh, you know, 11 lineal, lineal feet of the sidewalk. So rather than leaving the cracked piece of sidewalk here, we asked the contractor to replace those two segments, 11 feet of it. So that's what's before you for your consideration. At the same unit you know, price that they did the original documents, the original project. And the drive through was on all the new concrete. Seven days worth of curing, but as we explained, you can't run a load and end up across four inches of concrete that's meant for pedestrian traffic. And, and no fault of, you know, young kid, <laughs> I should say that, inexperienced driver backing up between the sidewalk and the fence to get some gravel on the back fence of what happened. Very good. Any other questions, comments? I'll entertain a motion. Move for approval of IFB number 22-C004, change order number one, increase square yardage of sidewalk and lineal footage of curb and gutter town road 71.1. Second the motion. Commissioner Lee Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Hass? Yes. Commissioner Pete Lopez? Yes. Item 8H, consideration of King, Am King Ambulance License Renewal. Commissioner, before you for your consideration, is King Ambulance's license renewal via statute? The board is obligated to uh, license ambulances that operate within Los Angeles County. And we received a lot of information, and uh, on it, I believe the council mentioned that there were no concerns with the documentation attached. Any questions? Discussion, otherwise, I will entertain a motion. You have to make a motion to approve the King Ambulance License Renewal. Second the motion. Commissioner Hass? Yes. Commissioner Luis Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Pete Lopez? Yes. Uh, item 8I, consideration of South Region Emergency Management Mutual Aid Agreement. Good morning, Ms. Chavez. Good morning. So before you, we have a mutual aid agreement we've been working on for some time. COVID kind of put it on the back burner. Um, we're working together with our, my regional emergency managers and DHSEM to come up with some kind of agreement to help each other. We've been doing it verbally. We just want it in writing. How many counties are? Um, five. It's us, Pueblo, Fremont, Orfano, and Custer. Any uh, discussion, questions for Ms. Chavez? There was a typo on page five, but I have since had it corrected. Um, they were referring to Delta County. We borrow each other's plans, and so that was an oversight, so I did get it corrected. Thank you, that was. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> beat you to it. <laughs> yes, thank you. Appreciate that. 
Any other questions? Commissioners? Commissioners. Commissioners also, I have uh, just emailed you folks a revised resolution for this mutual aid agreement. And uh, if you approve this agreement, then I'd also like the board to consider this as a resolution that is part of the mutual aid agreement. I'll put it up on the screen. Uh, any additional questions? Okay, I will entertain a motion follow up with the uh, resolution for this agreement. Move for approval of this South Region Emergency Management Mutual Aid Agreement with the. <coughs> we'll, we'll consider the resolution. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Second. Commissioner Lee Sothers? Yes. Commissioner Hass? Yes. Commissioner Felix Yes. Mr. Dorokant, would you agree the uh, resolution? See if I can uh, get it up on the screen for the board. And the reason I was asking is because Delta County is just a little bit. Well, that's what my question was why would we go to court in Delta County and it was just an oversight on yeah. a person, Pueblo EM or it, borrow it or whatever. Yeah, that's great. That's cooperation and partnership. Yes, and we're doing it now. It's just we, we've been wanting to get it in writing. So. Resolution 22-022, resolution approving a mutual aid agreement for fire protection and other emergency services assistance between South Region parties. Whereas Los Angeles County, Custer County, Fremont County, Oracle County, all political subdivisions of the state of Colorado, the Pueblo County Sheriff, print parties in print, have collaborated to enter into an all hazards mutual aid agreement grant MMA in print in an attempt to Consolidate and supersede all previous individual mutual aid agreements. Whereas the proposed MMAA is an all hazards agreement that reflects the many different types of responses encountered by the various emergency departments and their four mission parties. Whereas the purpose of the MAA is to establish the terms and conditions by which any party to the MMA may request aid and assistance from one another in responding to a significant event, emergency, or disaster that exceeds the resources available to them. Requesting party, whereas the party, the parties have agreed upon the terms of the proposed MMA attached here to, which shall commence on the date that the, MM, the MAA is executed by the parties that shall terminate as specified in the attached MMA, and whereas Los Angeles County Board of County Commissioners have reviewed the proposed MAA attached here to, and believes it is in the best interest of the county to approve and enter into the attached MAA. Therefore, be resolved by the Los Angeles County Board of County Commissioners to mutual aid agreement, print a copy of which is attached to this resolution, be and hereby is approved, and be a further resolved that the Los Angeles County Board of County Commissioners is authorized to execute the mutual aid agreements on behalf of the county. On motion made, the second and third we vote this resolution is adopted the May 2022. I order the board of the county commissioner of Los Angeles County, Colorado, followed by your signature plans. Thank you, Mr. Brunkamp. Any uh, discussion and questions? Yeah, question. I hate to, to be in John Main Cloud. Can we attach this resolution to our agenda being out of the agenda item? Um, as we, since we have this as an emergency and mutual aid agreement? It's because you, it's part of your approval of the agreement. The resolution is part of it. It's not a separate agenda item. Commission, that's my prepare. Um, council did explain that to me once. Uh, and combining the two, and I did not do that. Just making sure we can move forward. Thank you, Councilor. Commission, ask any other questions? No. Okay, I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve the South Region Commission Member Mutual Aid Agreement. Or actually, what's the what's the uh, twenty-two dashes? I'm sorry, I was sending that motion. Motion to approve resolution 22 0 Second motion. Commissioner Hass? Yes. Second motion. Commissioner Luis Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Felix Lopez? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hass. Okay, uh, section number nine the financial matters consideration of bills in favor for the first half of May 2022. Director Colbert. As of May 15th, 
was $167,771.17. Did you have any questions on table? Well, since you're not here, I got about 15 questions for you. No, no questions. Okay. Uh, bills, bills paid on May 4th, 93908 50 uh, We purchased fuel on May 11th for $27,316. May 11th, invoices were $66,000. $48.99. Within that packet, we paid um, South Central COG, uh, or a council of government, um, $13,000 for 2021 dues. Um, we paid Fisher, we paid THK for $12,000 for the Fisher Pink Impact Study, and then um, U.S. Postmaster for our elections post, which are $4,800. And that's it. Questions? The, uh, the only thing uh, is probably that I had is on the uh, on the accounts payable. There was one, a couple of items under Cordoba Pass Tower, small expenditures. And I think those are utilities that we pay monthly. Very good. Cordoba Pass, but that's the utilities that we pay that time. Very good. Any other questions? I'm going to take a motion to approve the financials. Move for approval of the bills of payroll for the first half of the year 2022. Second. Commissioner Lee Smokers? Yes. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Phoenix Smokers? Yes. At this point in time, I'm going to entertain a motion to suspend the uh, regular Board of County Commissioners so we can go into the Board of uh, Human Services. Make the motion to suspend Board of County Commissioners to go into sitting in the capacity of the Board of Human Services. Second the motion. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Luis Lopez? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Wait one second. Tom? This meeting is now ended. You asked me to remind you. <laughs>